We ran Kingdra a very long time ago in just the battles, and now it is time for the entire horsey line to shine. I tell you what, these are some of my absolute favourite runs to do here on the channel. I love taking the Pokemon we ran in just the battles, and instead of starting fully evolved, we have to earn that evolution. Now, Kingdra is a bit of a special case, because it's a trade evolution. So the workaround I have is that I'm going to use the Dragon Scale as the evolution item. That means we won't be able to have a Kingdra until after we've defeated Claire's Kingdra and gone into Mount Mortar to get the item. We'll have to see just how much harder that makes the run, but for now let's take a look at the stats of our horsey. We're level 5 with 18 HP, we're holding a berry and our only move is bubble. We've got 9 in attack, 12 in defense, 12 in special attack, 7 in special defense, and 12 also in speed. Now bubble is an absolutely terrible move, so the early gameplay is going to be grinding on those Geodude we find on Route 46. And after beating up enough Geodude to grow all the way up to level 9, we are ready to take on the rival. Now, the reason we grew to level 9 is because that's the amount of bubble PP we had, and that's when we ran out of bubbles. Now, the rival's going to have Chikorita, even though we gain a resistance to grass when we're a Kingdra, we'll only have a single rival battle at that point, and that fifth rival battle is generally meaningless, so for the lion's share of the run, we are going to be weak to Chikorita's grass-type moves. This battle was a bit of a slog, but we did eventually make it through, and we can move on towards Falkner. Now, at Falkner, we still only have Bubble. Our next attacking move doesn't come until level 22 via level up, that's going to be Water Gun, and even Water Gun isn't a great move. We're relying on having that berry to get through this battle, because without the berry we'd be in a lot more peril. Bubble really is a terrible move, I cannot stress that enough. We did eventually get through Falconer though, we obtain the Zephyr Badge and we pick up Swift in Union Cave to try and make the Bugsy fight a little bit more tolerable. We've also got Leah at this point and Leah will lower physical defence if we need to, so let's see how Bugsy gets on. We use Swift against the Metapod and it takes three Swift to knock it out, and we're holding the PlayStation Network Cureberry just in case this Kakuna poisons us. Of course, as always happens, when we're prepared, he doesn't poison us, and we're on to the Scyther. Fury Cutter crits on turn 1, which isn't great for us, but we crit back on turn number 2. Unfortunately, Fury Cutter hits us very hard, and we get knocked out. We're back to square 1, and this time we're holding a berry. We're going to hope that Kakuna doesn't poison us, and that will give us an extra 10 hit points against the Scyther. We start smoke screening to try and lower Scyther's accuracy, and he swaps into Quick Attack instead. There are critical hits flying all over the place, but they go in our favour and we defeat Bugsy in a time of 21 minutes and 25 seconds. The split was a bit late there on the graphics, but don't worry, that won't affect our overall time. We can't celebrate for too long though after Bugsy, because Rival 2 is literally just around the corner. He's going to lead with Ghastly, and by this point we do have Water Gun. That's going to make Ghastly a breeze. But this Bayleaf really is going to be a thorn in our side. It has not only poisoned us, it's set up Reflect. That means my only option really is to start leering and hope for the best. It doesn't work out though, and we are going to have to go back to the start of the battle, because Zubat hits us with a bite, and we get knocked out. Let's try that again, shall we? We know the Ghastly is meaningless, we can get rid of that in a 100% accurate water gun. The thing to do is to try and stop this Bayleaf, from completely annihilating us. Our best option here is to decimate its accuracy, go for a bunch of Leers, and hope that Razorleaf misses every single time. We're able to get very lucky and survive on 35 HP as Razorleaf missed more times than I care to admit there. We get the confusion luck we need against the Zubat to defeat the rival on our second try in a time of around about 26 minutes. Let's now take on Whitney. She is, of course, the normal type specialist of Goldenrod Gym, and we have an upgrade on Swift because we've got Headbutt. We're going to be trying to take advantage of our high speed, and we're going to try and flinch the cow. It doesn't help, though, that we have been attracted straight away. That means on average we can only move every other turn, and even though we got Milk Tank deep into the red, it used Milk Drink and we are back to the beginning once more. Once again we're against this Clefairy, we're going to headbutt it because it really is the best strategy. We get 5 double slaps which is just adding insult to injury, and now we're starting the smoke screen again. 
We only do the one to prevent rollouts, and then we just need a single stomp miss. We're very lucky to get it on this attempt, and that means we are through Whitney in a time of 34 minutes and 36 seconds. We're now up in the lighthouse where we're gonna battle Sailor Terrell. We've got Surf at this point, courtesy of the Kimono Girls, so we now have one of the pieces in place for a very strong Pokemon. And the next piece comes right now. We grow to level 32 and we evolve into Seedra. We're stuck with Seedra now until after Claire, but I'm sure that will be more than cromulent enough. We've got 95 in special attack. That's gonna be very good combined with Surf. And we can see here against the third rival battle, both the Haunter and the Magnemite go down in a single hit. We combine that with the customary Hidden Power Ice and the Bayleaf is suddenly no issue, and that also gives us something super effective against the Zubat. The rival has now become pretty insignificant. He normally does at this point of the run anyway because we've got a lot more moves available to us, and that's going to be a theme as we go through all the challenge runs together. Another theme is that our fourth gym battle's always Morty. He's a Ghost and Poison type specialist who's led with two fainted ghosts and we're on to the Gengar. Seedra is more than powerful enough to sweep the entire gym. We grow to level 35 and we get the badge in a time of 45 minutes and 44 seconds, and we cross the open seas to face Chuck. He is our fifth gym leader together. He is, of course, a fighting type specialist who leads with Primeape. Surf takes that out in one hit, and now we're going to swap to the headbutt for Poliwrath. Arrogance got the better of me in this particular battle, because I didn't think we'd need the Mint Berry. I thought we could save a little bit of time by not menuing, and look at how it bit me in the bum. We just get the worst RNG luck at the very end of the battle. We hurt ourselves in confusion several times, we get sent back to sleep, and I think let's just try again, shall we? This time I'm not letting Hubris get in the way, I've got that Mint Berry equipped here on the Seedra. And, as is always the way, when we're holding the berry, we don't actually need it. Storm Badge acquired in 48 minutes and 36 seconds. Let's cross to the east of Johto now, where Price is waiting in Mahogany's gym. He's the Ice-type specialist who leads with a very non-Ice-type seal, and honestly, our best combination of moves will be Surf and Headbutt. Against the Dugong, we're going to Headbutt it better than it can Headbutt us, and instead it goes for an Aurora Beam of all things. Very weird choice there. Of course, Pilot Swine is weak to water, so we Surf it away, and we get the option to learn Agility. I decide no, because I'm kinda happy with our current learn set, and that's the Glacier Badge acquired in 54 minutes and 36 seconds. Jasmine is our 7th gym leader, and when she's 7th, she's usually easy. It's a single surf on both the Magnemites, and it's not going to be any different against the Steelix either. All three go down in a single hit, and we defeat Jasmine in a time of 55 minutes and 30 seconds. And with that, we have 7 of our 8 Jotonian gym badges. We've only got one rival battle and one gym battle to go until we evolve, so let's start off by picking off the rival. Golbat and Magnemite now mean absolutely nothing in this battle. They both get one shot away with Surf. Here comes Meganium, and we'll swap to Hidden Power. We take a decent chunk of health off it. The rival, however, must know that we're trying to go for the fastest possible time, because that poison does nothing apart from waste our time by going into the bag an extra time. We defeat the fourth rival battle in just past the hour mark, and we can make our way over to Blackthorn City where Claire lives. Claire, of course, has a Kingdra, which we want, so we're going to have to do our best to prove ourselves to Claire. We really want that badge. She leads with three Dragonair, they're no issue whatsoever. We've got Hidden Power Ice and Decent Special Attack. It's Kingdra versus Seedra, though. We start with a Twister because it's super effective, and Claire flinches. I was trying to get a single knockout with Return, but that didn't work, so we might as well just use Return three more times to get rid of it. And we are through Claire in a time of 1 hour 9 minutes and 44 seconds, and we acquire the badge itself in a time of 1 hour 10 minutes and 38 seconds. Let's now quickly pop over to Mount Malto where we can get the Dragon Scale, and we can at long last say goodbye to Seedra and hello to Kingdra. We're now at the final evolution for this run, and just in time for the final rival battle of this run. This time he's going to lead with Sneasel, but yet again he's not going to be an issue. If anything, these rival battles just waste time. There's absolutely nothing threatening about any of his team. We've got coverage for all of his Pokemon, and the only one that might be a two-shot is the Meganium. We've got a while to get there, though, because the Haunter comes out. Then it's going to be the Kadabra, and finally it's going to be the Meganium. All of those were one-shots. Let's have a look at the Meganium. It's a Hidden Power Ice, taking it deep into the red. Meganium's attack misses, and we finish it off with another Hidden Power. So we have a time of 1 hour 15 minutes and 47 seconds for the final rival battle. 
Let's now heal up our party in preparation for the Pokemon League. We will say thank you to the HM friends, so it's thank you to Kenya, to Abra, to Psyduck, and merci to Paris. We'll buy our four full restores, and then we'll get ourselves prepped for the League. I'm not expecting great difficulty in this League, although this is going to be one of the very few times where we're going to be weak to Lance's signature type. We'll save the run here just in case things go really badly, and we'll take a look at our stats. We've got 172 HP at level Level 52, we're holding the Scamulet coin with Surf, Hidden Power, Ice, Dragon Breath, and Return. We've got 138 in attack, 139 in defense, 142 in the specials, and 127 in speed. They are, of course, the outer battle stats. The in battle stats will be significantly higher, and we'll see that against Will. He's our first league member, he's a psychic type specialist, and he leads with Zatu. We surf away the Zatu, so he sends out Jinx. We'll swap to return for Jinx because Jinx has no physical defense. Executor is third up on the chopping block, and we've got Hidden Power Ice for that. That goes down in a single hit, and here comes Slowbro. On paper, Slowbro is the hardest Pokemon in this battle, but we critical hit with Return to make sure we knock it out and then some. We swap back to Surf for the final Zatu, and we are through Will in a time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 6 seconds. Up next is Koga. He's the Poison Type Specialist, and he leads with Ariados. We use Surf against the Ariados, and a Stab Surf is more than enough to knock it out. It does exactly the same for the Venomoth, and here comes the Fortress. Fortress is quite bulky, but not bulky enough to withstand a Surf, and then we swap to return for the Muck. The Muck is much more specially defensive than physically defensive, so that was definitely the right play. And now we're in a bit of a quandary with this Crobat. I decide to just take the healing loop and hope for the best. We're on full health and a high roll takes care of the Crobat, and we are through Koga in a time of 1 hour, 17 minutes and 46 seconds. Our third league member is Bruno. He's the fighting type specialist who leads with Hitmontop. It's a very good sign that we one-shot Hitmontop with Surf. Let's try it again with the Hitmonlee. This time though we swap to return because that's going to be the better move, and then we stick with return for the Hitmonchan. We take a little bit of damage from a pair of Mac punches, but if that's the worst he does, I'm going to be happy. We surf the Machamp and cross chop hits, but it barely even tickles us. We've got a lot of bulk here as a Kingdra, and the Onyx is no issue, so we are through Bruno in 118.24. Let's try Karen. Karen really is the hardest member of the league, all because of this Scumbrion. We use Dragon Breath to paralyze it though, and it gets fully paralyzed. We then start surfing away, and we don't have any stat drops at the beginning of this battle. Vileplume second on the chopping block, and we use a hidden power ice to take it deep into the red. Unfortunately, though, we get paralysed, and this could prove to be very, very bad in this battle. Fortunately for us, though, Gengar doesn't curse. I'm not quite sure why it didn't curse, but that gave us the in we needed to make sure we weren't on a clock for the rest of this battle. We also didn't get fully paralysed at all, so Karen was a lot easier than she ought to have been. We get through her in a time of 1 hour, 19 minutes and 12 seconds, and now the final obstacle between us and the Hall of Fame is Lance, the liar with the flyers, who leads with Gyarados. Now, as battles with Lance go, this one should be fairly trivial. That Gyarados is very timid, it only hits us for 5 HP. We've got a 4 times super effective Hidden Power Ice for the 3 Dragonite that are going to come out next, and then we'll have Surf for the final 2 Pokemon. Lance quite often can be a bit of a struggle, but when you're a decent special attacker and you have that super effective Ice move, his weaknesses really do show. Combine it with Water for the final 2 Pokemon, and this is an absolute breeze. We are through Lance in a time of 1 hour, 20 minutes and 7 seconds, and our Hall of Fame time is going to be 1 hour, 20 minutes and 23 seconds. That is not bad considering we started with a horsey with Bubble, but there's still an awful lot more to come. There's 8 gym badges plus the red fight, so don't you dare go anywhere. Kanto is next. And as we make landfall back in Vermilion City, we can go into the Pokemon fan club and get our first rare candy of the Kanto region. Of course, the first thing we do in Kanto is the last thing we do in Johto. We get that rare candy from the chairman of the Pokemon fan club, and then we can make our way into our first Kantonian gym. It's right here in Vermilion City, it's Lieutenant Surge's gym, and we can breathe a sigh of relief now because we are not going to come across another super effective move against us for the rest of this run. This is one of Kingdra's big strengths. It's only weak to Dragon in this generation, and the only Dragon-type trainers are Claire and Lance. 
Everything else should be an absolute breeze. So we'll see how the action goes on in the background while I have a little chat with you about the old Just the Battle series and plans for that going forwards. I will be perfectly honest with all of you, I never really enjoyed the Just the Battle series. It kind of felt like the vibes were wrong for the timing of that series. But during my time off, it's been something I've been umming and eyeing about bringing back in a slightly different way. Instead of it being the high base stat totals and the fully evolved Pokemon, I'm just going to do the fully evolved Pokemon from the start. So we'll start afresh with the leaderboard, and what we'll do is we'll pick out those Pokemon that are the final stage of either a two or three stage evolutionary line, and we'll give them their own leaderboard, where we start with the final stage from the beginning. It should prove to be very interesting, a little bit like this run now, where we're comparing the whole line against the Just the Battles time, but we're doing it in reverse. So we're getting the whole line's time first, and then we're seeing just how much of an improvement, if any, starting with the fully evolved Pokemon will do. In addition to that, I do want to do the Little Cup at some point. That's going to be an awful lot of work though, because those Pokemon will not evolve. So we'll be starting with the lowest stage in each evolutionary line, and yet again we're going to be giving them their own leaderboard. That one will probably be the hardest series of any we do here together on the channel because we are going to be looking at Pokemon that have ridiculously low base stat totals. Some of them I can pretty much guarantee won't make it over the line. Your Weedles, your Metapods, your Magikarps, they're going to stand no chance. So instead we're going to take them as far as we can and the restriction on rare candies is going to be lifted for that series. So not only can we rare candy as soon as we've got them, we can also go to Buena straight away should we need more rare candies because I can absolutely guarantee that a lot of these Pokemon aren't even going to make it to the Pokemon League without that extra little help. And finally, we're going to be getting stuck in the middle. There are all those mid-stage evolutionary lines that never get a luck in because they're only there for either a few levels or you trade to get a Golem or an Alakazam. So we're going to be running all of those middle-stage evolutions and we're going to be trying to give the spotlight to a lot of those often overlooked Pokemon. I believe there's only 27 of those Pokemon in the game, so it's going to be a relatively short series, but it's the one I'm very much most looking forward to. Because honestly, unless they're one of your favourite Pokemon, who really thinks about the middle stage evolutions for too long? But they are the plans coming up for extra Crystal series here on the channel. I hope you're looking forward to them, and I'll probably test stream a few of these different ideas just to see if they do stick. So if you want to see those, then make sure you're subscribed, because that way you'll get notified whenever I go live. And then when the videos do start coming out, you'll be able to see those as well. But we'll now rejoin the action midway through the blue fight. We've already knocked out the Pidgeot and we are on to the Gyarados. Gyarados does actually have a super effective move. I forgot about that one earlier. However, Gyarados has such pitiful special attack that it might as well not be super effective. Blue's AI also hardly ever chooses it for some reason, but we're in a bit of a war of attrition with this Gyarados. We don't have anything too great for the water types. We eventually knock it out and the rest of the battle should be a relative breeze. We get rid of the Alakazam and now we're on to the Executor. We still have Hidden Power Ice on the learn set because we didn't have enough Cash Money Moolah for the Ice Beam after the League. We will be changing that to Ice Beam for the red battle, but it was a range against the Executor and we just low rolled. Now the final few Pokemon are going to be very trivial here for the rest of this battle. Even with the sunlight up, Arcanine can do nothing against us and we are through blue in a time of 1 hour 35 minutes and 40 seconds. And with that, there's only one more challenge left to go. We're going to make our way over towards Mount Silver where Red is waiting for us. He is the final challenge of the game and he's going to lead with Pikachu. Now the good news is we already outspeed and one shot the Pikachu, so that means we just have five Pokemon to contend with instead. The next one is Espeon and it's going to be a better play to go for its weaker physical defense as opposed to its special defense. We still get knocked out with a pair of Psychic though, so we're going to use three rare candies and get ourselves up to level 68. We surf against the Pikachu, it's completely irrelevant to this battle now, and this time I go for Surf against the Espeon. We get a very lucky critical hit and we can at least see how bad the Snorlax is going to be, and the answer is terrible. Body Slam paralyzes us, but we're going to try again at level 68. I can see a win condition at this level, so we're going to keep persevering. We take a lot of damage from Psychic, but this time we don't have the Reflect up. We get the Paralysis off on the Snorlax, and that is huge. Even with the Amnesia, we can start hitting away at it with Return. 
We've just got to make sure that that Snorlax does not take a nap. He gets fully paralyzed on the crucial turn and we can see the Venusaur. We have Ice Beam at this point, so Venusaur is a simple two shot and we'll be able to see what the Blastoise is going to do. Blastoise is relatively dangerous because of course it does have that very powerful Blizzard and because we've got the Dragon type we are neutral to Blizzard now. We've just got to hope that we don't freeze though because if we get through the Blastoise we are absolutely fine. We're going to outspeed the Charizard and a Stab Surf should be more than enough to knock it out in one shot and with that we have defeated Red in a time of 1 hour 40 minutes and 24 seconds. Definitely slower than the original Just the Battles Kingdra run, but we were starting with a horsey for goodness sake. We're in 34th place on the leaderboard, just in between Miltank and Pseudo Wudo, and that is a very, very respectable time. Now that does push Smeagol down into the page 3 drop zone in 50th place, and our new leader of page 3 is Muck. Right down at the bitty bottom of the leaderboard still is Shuckle in 74th place, but I'm sure it'll get some company relatively soon. And on page 1, it is all the same. Surely this page 1 has to change soon, it's Giraffering in top spot, with Scyther second and Ursaring third. But with that, we are done for another run. It has, of course, been a pleasure as always. If you've enjoyed this run, then please do remember to leave a like. If you want to see more runs just like this, then click the subscribe button. If you've got any feedback at all, leave it in the comments down below. And until next time, when we're running Lapras together, I'll say thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all very, very soon.